Time now for Across Africa, our weekly look at stories from across the continent. I'm Georgia Calvin-Smith, and today, delegates for the UN Security Council met some of the thousands displaced by ongoing clashes in eastern DR Congo, even as more civilians were caught up in the battle between soldiers and M23 rebels. Also, a new exhibition is set up in Senegal to bear witness to the trauma and abuse suffered by Gambians who lived through the 22-year rule of former President Yaya Jame. Many of his victims were forced to flee the country. And a celebration of the diversity of Cameroonian cuisine gives local and US chefs a chance to get to go with traditional dishes and swap know-how and expertise. We go along, of course, for a taste. But first, in DR Congo, M23 militia continued to target civilians, even as a UN Security Council delegation visited the country's restive east and called for a political solution to the insurgency. The conflict has forced over 800,000 people from their homes, some of whom have found refuge in a displaced persons camp in Goma, our correspondents report. Gathered, exhausted, they all have come to welcome the United Nations representatives visiting the Bushagara camp. These displaced people arrived here at the gates of Goma six months ago after fleeing the fighting between the Congolese army, armed groups and the M23. During its visit, the UN delegation encouraged the continuation of the Nairobi and Luanda peace processes to help silence the guns. Congolese authorities are calling for sanctions against Rwanda, which they accuse of supporting the M23. Kigali denies this support. While the UN has condemned Rwanda's involvement in the conflict, the organization believes that in order to move forward with the discussions, responsibilities must be shared. There is a responsibility that falls on the DRC itself. They are responsible for the security of the country. This is a sovereign country. The Congolese army must act, act against the groups. In the Bushagara camp, the displaced expected more than condemnations from the UN representatives. What all of them want are solutions to the conflict so that one day they can return home. We are suffering here in the East. In 2007, we already fled the war. Today we are still fleeing. We have been hearing promises from the international community for over 20 years. We hear that they're going to find solutions, but the war still goes on. Despite the announced ceasefire, clashes continue in the east of the country, particularly in Saki, a town located less than 30 kilometers from Goma. According to the United Nations, in just one year, in North Kivu, more than 800,000 people have been forced to flee their villages. In Ivory Coast, villagers have blamed a gold processing plant for toxic levels of water pollution across several regions in the east. Officials have set up an investigation to look into the environmental impact of its operations. Our correspondents tell us more. Willy, in central Ivory Coast, is devastated by water pollution. Lake Baia, cornerstone of the province, is unrecognizable. In the last year, the local river became a thick brown stream. Locals from Willy and 10 villages in the area blame Samina, a gold company that recently moved to the region. This waterbed you see here contains fish. But today there are no more fish. There is no more life. This water is dead. There's nothing left. We are the leading producers of food in our region. But this year we had nothing. The gold company Samina denies any responsibility and hasn't responded to France 24's request for comments. The Ivorian Pollution Control Centre collected water samples for analysis in the hopes of identifying the nature and source of the pollution. If we find chemical elements in the water, there will be an impact on fish resources. The food chain will be contaminated. And as we consume fish, inevitably humans will also be contaminated. This toxicologist warns that water contaminated with industrial waste can have severe sanitary and environmental impacts. We will have all kinds of diseases that can become embedded in these areas. For example, mercury or cyanide can cause lung diseases, neurological diseases or blood diseases. Fish and shellfish will be affected. Dozens of gold companies are currently operating in Ivory Coast. 
According to the National Anti-Pollution Centre, water contamination is on the rise in areas where gold mining is most intensive. Uganda's parliament's taken up a bill that would go further than a current ban on same-sex relations and would instead criminalise identifying as LGBTQ. If passed, that would make Uganda the first African country to do so. It proposes to punish those convicted with up to 10 years in prison. The move will weigh further on the lives of LGBTQ plus people who already face widespread discrimination in the country. Eric Indawula was recently outed as gay in a video that was posted online. Soon after, his landlord confronted him and issued an eviction notice. His story showcases the widespread discrimination and prejudice faced by homosexuals in Uganda. There are a lot of people that I know that have chosen to recloset themselves, hide deep down because they are scared of coming out. A largely conservative Christian country, Uganda has been cracking down on LGBTQ rights for years. In 2013, authorities introduced a law making gay sex, which was already illegal, punishable by death, but it was later struck down by the Supreme Court. And earlier this month, Parliament began work on another draft law calling for the reintroduction of the death penalty. It's a clear indication that they want to erase anything around the human rights of LGBTQ persons in Uganda. And definitely the end game is come up with a stronger legislation. In January, Uganda's parliament ordered an investigation into the alleged promotion of homosexuality in schools, with some MPs even hinting at a countrywide LGBTQ conspiracy. Schools are already consuming study material that is contaminated with this kind of vice. It is not something that just comes by. It means that there could be a number of people who are already behind, behind this move. For many activists, even if the bill is struck down, the language employed by officials who've referred to homosexuality as a cancer and a human wrong already has far-reaching consequences. The 22-year reign of former Gambian President Yaya Jame ended in 2017 and was marked by extensive human rights abuses. He's now living in exile in Equatorial Guinea to avoid prosecution, but his rule still casts a long shadow. Many of his victims fled to Senegal, and now a temporary exhibition has been set up there to give voice to those who suffered through his rule. Our Sam Bradpiece went to have a look. Memory House is a Gambian exhibition project that uses visual storytelling to document abuses that took place under Yahya Jame's regime and to stop the perpetrators from fading into obscurity. For the first time, it's visiting Senegal, where hundreds of school children have come to learn about the not so distant past. To be honest with you, I didn't know much about all this. I had heard stories, but I didn't realize how bad it was. None of us want what happened in the Gambia to happen to us. They really suffered. There were people who lost everything. People were traumatized. Sira Ndao's uncle was killed by the Jame regime. She's now a human rights activist determined to make sure that the mistakes of the past don't happen again. As you can see, we have students here. We're here engaging with students from Senegal. We do the same thing in Gambia, where we engage with the students and next generation to teach about human rights violations and how we can prevent that and how we can um, um, cultivate a culture, a sustainable culture of human rights and rule of law in Gambia. There are future plans for the Memory House exhibition to visit Ghana, Nigeria and New York. Now, a celebration of the diversity of Cameroonian cuisine wrapped up this month called the Diaspora Kitchen Festival. It was a chance for chefs from near and far to get to grips with traditional dishes and swap know-how and expertise. Our team went along for a taste. In a celebration of Cameroonian culinary culture, about 20 local and Afro-American chefs gathered in Mwanko on the banks of River Sanaga for the first ever Diaspora Kitchen Festival. This is a type of vegetable that we all know. It comes from cassava. For 48 hours, a selection of traditional dishes representing different Cameroonian cultures are served. 
and the mise en scène has not been left to chance. A village has been set up, complete with huts, traditional kitchens and even a temporary market. I made a kind of living museum. You could see people eating earlier. Some come here to shop. The chefs are doing their thing. It reminds us of the atmosphere of our villages, our kitchens. Chefs use local products in their creations. Sandrine is one of eight participating Cameroonian cooks and shares her culinary skills with her African-American colleagues as she prepares a meal of seasoned freshwater fish steamed in plantain leaves. The tomatoes, the onions and cut them into tiny bits. Sandrine is delighted to see similarities between dishes she grew up with and some meals prepared by the African-American chefs. We find some elements of our Cameroonian cuisine in theirs, maize, beans, fish. We exchange knowledge. As chefs, we try to learn and I think they will also take some tips back with them. Oh, very good, chef. Sanders is an American chef and has run a restaurant in the United States for 10 years. She hopes that what she learns here in Cameroon will enrich her own work. When I go back to the States, I will be taking what I learned here today um, and putting it into my food and trying to recreate things, but also um, being original. This first festival was widely seen as a success, leaving the public and participants satisfied and clamoring for more. A second edition of the Diaspora Kitchen has already been scheduled for next year. Looks delicious. Well, that is, though, all we have time for, for across Africa for now. But do join us again next time if you can. Till then, take care.